Hello, world singers. My name is Tyler. And my name is Brooke. And this is Cosmere Cosmere Conversations. Conversations. We are back with a new couple of episodes that we have planned here that actually came to us from a fan suggestion right Brooke yeah fans suggested that we do an episode uh talking about different relationships throughout the Cosmere and we have taken that suggestion and kind of taken it one step further actually they were suggesting uh romantic relationships so that's what we're gonna do today and then we have a couple other episodes lined up that will be covering like parental or mentorship relationships and then a third one talking about friendships or rivalries yeah when we started to look at all the different types of relationships it became pretty apparent that some of the most interesting and uh meaningful relationships weren't found in the traditional couple or sexual relationship. Which is something that's really nice about Brandon Sanderson's writing is that he doesn't just rely on that romantic relationship, but he really does a good job of showing meaningful relationships in a variety of different um, configurations, which is what most of our lives look like. Absolutely. And I think that the fun aspect of these next couple of episodes is going to be that we can get some feedback from the fans on Facebook or Twitter or Reddit. We're basically everywhere. Cosmere Convo. From their opinions and the feelings about different relationships that they see as super important because everyone kind of has a different aspect of these books that they connect to and that you know, hits them or touches them. Maybe someone will be like really uh, into the relationships of like the Bridgman uh, from Stormlight Archive. Oh, yeah. Where someone else might truly identify with some of these romantic relationships that we're going to go over today. So, Brooke, do you want to start us off? I want to put a little caveat out there, a little uh, important thing to mention. The last two episodes for us have been no spoilers they have been spoiler free however the tradition of cosmere convos all spoilers all the time and we are back at it okay so everybody is forewarned from now until infinity unless we specifically (laughs) mention that there is going to be no spoiler episodes we're doing spoilers so this is breaking every single aspect of the cosmere wide open let's dive in For me, this was one of the first relationships that I was exposed to in the Cosmere. I'd done the little readings of the novellas and kind of slowly built my way up, but the big one I jumped in with was Mistborn. And so we're going to start this conversation about Vin and Ellen. What do you think about Vin, our Mistborn main character, and her love interest from the very first book, but eventual husband, Ellen? There's a lot to like about this relationship. I think the biggest aspect that some people may dislike is just due to their age. These are two very young characters. And so some people could, you know, maybe not resonate with the way their relationship unfolds. There is something kind of nice about it if you can like think back to when you were you know 15 or whatever um i do think it's like an honest depiction of what love and relationships are like at that age i completely agree i think that as you were saying some people and parts of myself or at some points of a reading misborn this relationship kind of struck me as a little immature or childish but If you can put yourself in that place and understand not only are they young, but they are in the middle of a war, their society is crumbling, they're bringing down dictators that have ruled for a thousand years, and then they're fighting forces that have existed for 
you know, basically all time uh, and are like powers of creation. So this is an immensely stressful situation and they're very young characters. So I did feel some of the heightened aspects of their maybe anxieties or yeah. like foolishness early on. In and they- some places, it just gets to be like too much drama and it's just like, oh my God, can you just stop like stressing about this for a second and just like be a person? <laughs> but then you remember again, like they're 15 or whatever. So like when we were 15, we were probably doing the same thing. Like, oh my God, does he like me? Does he not like me? Am I pretty enough? <laughs> That kind of uh, obsessive tendencies on both sides, both like you feel Vin, who has all these important things to do and she's learning all this cool stuff, X, Y, Z, she'll like fall into some tendencies of self-doubt and just it can feel like so self-conscious about yes. her relationship and like is not confident a lot of times when you're like, oh, obviously you don't need to be. You're self-conscious the most about this everything powerful is fine warrior assassin that's ever existed it's like he's into you girl and like let's just go back to the cooler stuff <laughs> that is, okay so that is actually my main issue with this relationship is not because of the characters it is honestly because of the way that brandon wrote early relationships or excuse me relationships earlier in his career we'll cover this a little bit later in some of the other relationships we look at but i do think brandon's always strength was action scenes Mm -hmm. and his early weakness was the more quote-unquote mundane or the kind of in between like why is the action important well it's because of these cool characters and like he has clearly shown growth absolutely i was really thinking about this when i was recently reading skyward i no spoilers there's not gonna be any spoilers but i think that writing relationships is something that he has improved remarkably at um which is evidenced by comparing his new writing skyward to mistborn And I think that that is kind of the main aspect of Vin and Ellen's relationship I didn't like is that it kind of felt each time you went to the relationship side of the book, it was a huge shift and it didn't naturally kind of meld with the plot and and further the plot. Um, I I felt like... In some cases, I think there's like a few times when he uses the self-doubt in the relationship or something like that to further character development and to further plot. But there's definitely points when it feels unnecessary. And especially like you're saying, it's a world that is under a lot of stress and kind of everything else in the story is very heightened and stressful. And it's kind of nice in a book to have something that's stable to hold on to as a reader to kind of know like, okay, everything else is going on, but we can rely on Vin and Ellen together. Like that is the strong stable point. And I think I would have liked more of that. I think that's a really good point. And I think that One of the things that I did enjoy a lot about the writing of Mistborn is that each Vin and Ellen became more interesting characters individually, separate from the relationship side. But just as individual characters, I felt like both of them became more interesting over time, and I felt like the relationship aspect was just a little less underdeveloped yeah it kind of underdeveloped i mean i do think that their unique characteristics and personalities you know help each one of them individually become better people and embrace who they are um so i have like i think they're well matched you know i think they're a good couple i and i think that shows because by the end of it i really buy them as a couple yeah 100 i know that some of the fan feedback after book two was that ellen uh and vin didn't really fit or you know it was weird when ellen gets a huge power up just to like match vin in many ways but One of the most interesting aspects of Ellen's character arc, I felt, was uh, kind of demonstrated by his clothing choices. You remember how that was like an aspect of the book? And how 
early on, he felt very weird in the um, outfit that they had chosen for him, which was like the striking white with like kind of broad shoulders. And it was meant to just like be seen everywhere. And he was well, and just like he wasn't really used to dressing to impress in general, like he was used to sort of dressing more disheveled. He liked to kind of blend into the background and not be noticed and then having to step out in front and really be that signal um, was difficult. And he disliked it a lot at the beginning, but then by the end of the book, I think it's Vin or maybe one of the other characters like Zazed or Zazed, uh, who says, you know, he doesn't show that hesitation anymore. He looks like a king and he acts like a king. So that idea of like, fake it till you make it, like (laughs) Ellen really did fake it and then he made it. Yeah. Like he, and so that, I think was propelled forward by being with Vin and having a relationship with Vin. Yeah. But I wanted to feel that more through the writing is like Ellen got better because of this relationship and because of this growth. I think you can see the growth, but it wasn't always like apparent that it was yeah, coming well, from the relationship. And I think it kind of seems like each of them get better in spite of their relationship Mm -hmm. rather than because of. Yeah. Which I think is a detriment to, you know, I don't know. You want it to be a really good supportive relationship. What I think overall makes this relationship so powerful and, for example, if it was ever brought to the screen, like is being worked on, but Brandon has no control over that. That's just happening in the background. But we might see a Mistborn movie and I think that... What makes the relationship so good is that kind of third act or that final bit of their relationship and the way that their story ends when they are yeah. literally, you know, hand in hand uh, as as the world ends. I think that it is a powerful depiction of growth that's possible. And I think it could, I mean, I, I think that all authors deal with this and all creative people deal with this but like if brandon went back and rewrote mistborn i feel like his ability now to write relationships would really just like yeah, be on it display would take it to a whole other level i think i think what we will come to see as we keep talking about these other relationships is that like vin and ellen's is interesting and there's lots of components of it But there are other relationships that come in later stories that are really, really powerful. And like Brandon really shows what he's capable of. So let's go on to the next one. Siri and Susebrin from Warbreaker. Warbreaker is a book that really is about a relationship. It's about a marriage, an arranged marriage, right? We have the planned god king of Susebrin who is ordained or or the plan is to marry the vena princess of what's their little kingdom called idris yes uh the princess of idris or whatever pronunciation you prefer this original plan goes astray and siri instead is married to susebrin in what is one of my favorite relationships that Brandon wrote, and this just proves that like he always had the ability because Warbreaker is a very early relationship. And both of those characters have a lot of like immature childlike characteristics. So I do think it's kind of a good comparison to Vin and Ellen in that respect, where he's writing two characters that would have you know, a similar relationship of that kind of early, young, immature um, type of characteristics. I think what makes this relationship so interesting is that it does begin and develop with less emphasis on the sexuality. In fact, the sexuality is like a joke. Uh, early on because it's just not happening Uh, and instead more on this relationship that siri has with being terrified and fearful of the god king and going through this process of fear to confusion to interest and intrigue because she's a very curious person yeah i was just gonna say i think the 
defining characteristic of this relationship is curiosity from mm-hmm. both sides. Because I think everything that you just said about Siri also applies to Sue Sebra. And yes. in, like this circumstance of two people who have been told stories about the other person that are not true. And so this like process of really breaking through, you know, maybe your first impression or your story of who this person is, and then discovering who they really are underneath is a really beautiful love story. And that is what is so powerful. Like, yes, they're immature but they they come at it from like a different perspective where Vin and Ellen it's almost like they know what adult relationships are supposed to be like and they're kind of like trying to do that where Siri and Susebrin don't have that uh kind of background and they're both just so young that it's more like learning to be friends with someone and then falling in love with your best friend and that is what I find so interesting and then powerful about this relationship when obviously the climax of a very long book like warbreaker is not a short book uh it's often one that i suggest to people read first in the cosmere uh, but it's it's not a short book it develops over a long period of time their relationship takes a long time to develop but then by the end that development makes the impact and the climax so much better as they're trying to escape and there is this moment with light song when he's sacrificing himself and the god king like rises up to his full power it's like he was only able to do that because of siri 100 percent. like i think this is such a a good foil mm-hmm. for vin and ellen because siri and sue Sebrin have even farther to go to come together like they start further apart than Vin and Ellen do right they have they can't even communicate they have different languages of communication they have completely different cultures they you know they can't even communicate with each other and yet they come together so strongly and they make each other better yes like absolutely you can 100% say that Sue Severin is who he is at the end of the book because of Siri I think what is also so interesting is that there is mystery and intrigue inherent in this relationship. So that every chapter you get with Siri and Sue Severin is fascinating because you're figuring out what's going on with the God King. And with Vin and Ellen, how we were talking about, it kind of pulls away from what we thought was the cooler, more action parts of the story. In Warbreaker... This is the story. Yeah, and you just want more. You're like, oh my gosh, wait, what's happening? Like, I need to know more. Even when it's something as simple as like, Sue Severin is learning to read. Yeah, exactly. It's it's just like, tell me more. (laughs) What word did he just learn? (laughs) I really love the final act. But like you were saying, I think that this is a relationship that Brandon wrote incredibly well. It's well-conceived. And what we... We're talking about how their stories mirror each other. They're experiencing that fear at the same time, but Siri thinks, and it's only portrayed as if Siri's the only one. And then they're getting to that confusion stage, basically together. And they're getting to the curiosity phase, basically together. And then they go through all their other phases of their relationship. And it's by the end so powerful and so strong. And I really wish if there was you know brandon obviously huge listener of the podcast (laughs) i think if i could ask one thing it would be like what's the likelihood that we get a warbreaker sequel i mean he's definitely planning it but it's like really far down on his list of priorities and it keeps getting pushed further down um which i'm really sad about because this is a sequel that i've wanted to see for a very long time I think it comes from a place of Brandon wrote this story and this relationship so well that it's pretty much at a solid point where other stories he feels like he began and wants to continue because the stories aren't done. They're only but partially I, complete. But to me, this story is like so far from over. It definitely, well, we know it's definitely not because of other relationships we'll talk about in maybe the uh, next couple of the friends and the mentor episode. But uh, we obviously know that characters from Warbreaker are hugely important 
and I'm now forgetting that we don't have to keep doing the not spoiler thing. <laughs> We're all spoilers all the time here, people. Uh, Vivenna and, and Vasher on the other side of this Warbreaker coin are hugely important. And if they're hugely important, it means what happens in the Warbreaker universe is hugely important to Rashar and the rest of the yeah. Cosmere. And I think by the end of Warbreaker, it's like very clear that there are more stories to happen on that world and we just don't have them and I want them. <laughs> So for all the fan fiction writers, Brooke is going through your Warbreaker ideas <laughs> yeah. with a passion. She's just looking for more on that planet. I love Siri and Sue Severin. I, I think that it's a great relationship. And like you said, a foil to Vin and Ellen or an example of the other side of how to do a, a young relationship and a new relationship with young people uh, and do it really, really well and make it a key aspect of the story. Our next couple kind of ages up. We're basically going from young to old here. We have Shalon and Adolin from Stormlight Archive. Obviously, this one is a huge part of the story, but the story itself is just so massive and so epic that it's easy to forget that there is this aspect of of Shalon and Adolin's relationship that goes right through every single one of the books. Uh, obviously, Shalon is introduced to Adolin in Words of Radiance, the second book, uh, but we have, you know, this kind of driving factor, this, this driving force of plot that's pushing these two individuals together where Shalon is reaching out to Yasna she's becoming her mentor Yasna is obviously related to Adolin like these characters were always going to be on a collision course but in my mind it's so beautiful how it all comes together and then by the end of Oathbringer we're like really in a good place with Shalon and Adolin's relationship and well I mean they get married I know so they're they're that's nuptials <laughs> that's what I'm saying it's like their their nuptials have like completely solidified this story that began with Shalon traveling the world or kind of following Yasna place to place just trying to be her mentee her ward uh her pupil her Padawan, <laughs> the different possibilities that come from that really just shows like how good a writer Brandon is that all of this makes sense and it all feels like it was kind of inevitable or it was just always driving a little bit of Shalon and Adolin's eventual relationship with everything that we got before. I love that Adolin's kind of like a playboy who can't uh, settle down with anyone. Yeah, I mean, I feel like he's not even really a playboy because I feel yeah, like not right he's word. not like trying to play them. He just can't find a woman that like keeps his interest, um, that he's like really interested, that he feels a, a connection to. Um, and I really love the way that their characteristics play off of each other. Um, and the way that Brandon's able to write these two characters who are very complex and nuanced individually, and then to put all of those nuances together and show the interplay of them is a difficult bit of writing, and I think he does a really fantastic job. That is such a good point, because Shalon is a completely separate character. Obviously, everybody knows this, but like she is not just the love interest of Adolin, which could easily, and we see this all the time in fiction and fantasy, like, oh, that character is the one who's in love with the main character. Well, and by the same token, Adolin doesn't versa, yeah. stay yet as just, like, Shallan's love interest. Like, he has his own issues and thoughts and feelings and things that he's dealing with in context of the relationship. That is obviously why Stormlight Archive is such an amazing piece of work is because you have what could be the focus and has been the focus of many a story throughout history, which is like girl with some cool magical powers or something meets boy who's like totally awesome and handsome. <laughs> that classic story. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is basically every fantasy story uh, that is simplistic basically and brandon's not doing the simplistic instead we have a character in adolin who 
has, as you mentioned, his own trials, his own ups and downs, his own thoughts and motivations. Where let the, I feel like Adolin's a real person. I, I think that he's a real dude who lives yeah. on the Shar. Yeah. And like is the prince and son of Dalinar Kolin and is one day going to inherit everything. I think that like that's a real person. And Shallan is the same way where she's a radiant in this universe and on and on and on. I think that the fact that just that you could create two characters who are separate and and wonderful and we believe are real people and then have their arcs perfectly meld together. Yeah, I think Oathbringer does such a good job of overlapping their arcs in a really beautiful way where they're each able to have their own separate adventures, but they're also able to adventure together and support each other in their own individual uh, ventures that they undertake. Um, They're both able to have moments of vulnerability with each other, which are really, really beautiful moments of relationship development. What I think about Shalon and Adolin, basically, is that they are the upgraded version of the Vin and Ellen or the the young relationship. It's what we see develop from Brandon as a writer and develop in these stories is like, this is the better version. Or if that Mistborn was going to be rewritten, like I suggested earlier, like we would get something that was closer to like Shallan and Adolin, where they were like these independent characters that beautifully merged together. I think that What I'm most excited about is the way that their relationship still experiences challenges and growth in the future because I despised all aspects of love triangles. Uh, (laughs) I I do not think that they... I actually... This one I didn't mind as much as I usually do. I don't like love triangles in general, but I think that this one with Kaladin felt more honest where you really could see how like Shalon and Kaladin had a lot in common and like could potentially get together like that felt real and honest and not just a plot device um but I am glad that it was brought to a pretty quick end I think that's an excellent point the idea that it was, it was brought to a quick end I think that what is most exciting is that their relationship still has a long way to go. And that by the end of, we don't know how, what's going to happen after book five, but we we expect that we're going to see a relationship that's going to start completely separate with literally two people on the different sides of the world, basically, and then come together, get married in the middle, the third book, and then have the rest of their relationship in book four and five, God willing, or Brandon willing, I should say. <laughs> uh, but the the idea that their relationship is going to start separate, merge, and then continue, I think that's just super beautiful and super rare. I just don't feel like it happens that often. Yeah, it's definitely a wonderful thing to be able to witness as a reader. I would be super interested to hear if anyone like ships Kaladin and Shallan and is like upset with the way the love triangle went. I would be interested to hear your arguments just for argument's sake. I'll listen to those arguments and then I'll be on the other side arguing oh, against you. <laughs> I mean, I agree. I agree. I am definitely Shallan Adolin, but I would just be interested to hear people's thoughts. I ship them so hard. It's it's bad. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just like, I would be upset if they, if it went any other way. I agree. I think that one of the things we will talk about in our friendship slash rivals episode in a couple of weeks is uh, Kaladin and his spren, Syl. I think that there are interesting things to talk about in reference to Shallan and Adolin. Uh, I'll just sweet tease, but <laughs> I'll throw this out there. I don't know what Syl was doing trying to encourage Kaladin to interject himself into Shallan and Adolin's relationship. 
I think Syl was messing up there. What's an honor brand doing about? Okay, let's save that for that. I know, that's what I'm saying, exactly. (laughs) I'm I'm just trying to like stir the pot. I'm just trying to make people angry a little bit. Just be like, what are you talking about? I just want to get a little ridiculous because I am trying to set up some comments and feedback from the fans. (laughs) Obviously, we're all just playing here. This is just silliness, but hit us up. If you have some thoughts about these relationships yeah. and if you have, you know, different opinions, for sure, those will be listened to. Should we move on to our next one? I would love to because I love this next relationship. Oh, me too. Probably we've we've passed the point of we'll call it relationship maturity. Uh, we are not with the immature younger people now. We're we're graduating. Yeah, because I mean, Shalon and Adolin are what like lo- um, high teens, low twenties. Yeah, I was gonna say low twenties, but early twenties. Early twenties, the word I was looking for. It's all good. And then now we're gonna move on to Wax and Steris from Mistborn Era Two, who I think Wax is late thirties, or and Steris is late twenties. Yeah, I think that. Wax might even be late 40s. Someone hit us back with the uh, age of Waxillium because I think that this is a relationship that benefits from age. It's like what they say about fine wines. I don't know if fine <laughs> wines actually get better as they age, but like that's what people say. And I think that this relationship gets better and exists because these characters have aged and are more mature. Yeah, and even though Steris is quite a bit younger than Wax... She has such a mature personality that I think they really exist on the same plane because Wax is older, but he has a much more immature sort of, you know, it took him a while to grow up and take responsibility and that kind of thing. So when they meet, they're really on the same playing field. I think that that idea of a man who is younger than his years and a woman who is older than her years is very interesting and the fact that let's just say that wax is late 30s or 40 and steris is late 20s or 30 the idea that they're both 35 like kind of is what i feel i don't know if the actual ages are correct but that's what it feels like it feels like wax needed to be he was a little bit rougher uh, and needed to be kind of worn down by time. And Steris has always been that old soul in a younger body. And the fact that they meet in all amid their craziness and their <laughs> world is just so wonderful. And I love that this relationship, this is the first one that we were talking about, at least in this episode, where the two characters didn't necessarily really like each other or connect when they first meet um they're just kind of resigned to being together because it's going to be practical um and then watching them like warm and discover each other's hearts throughout the course of the series is so rewarding and so beautiful i love that idea of discovering each other's hearts that's a really great way of explaining it is that these are guarded individuals who you know wax is a warrior who doesn't let a lot of his emotion show yeah they both have these personas yes that they're sort of trapped in that they have to maintain mm-hmm. right they both have like faces that they have to wear all the time in public and then slowly they each like see through the little cracks in their masks to see this like warm glow inside each of them I think that that concept is so powerful and it's one of my favorite aspects of the growth that Brandon was able to show with these characters and also just the growth of himself as a writer and as a person. Like He was probably a young man. I, he, he was married. But I believe, you know, his kids were either very young or hadn't had kids yet when he was working on the Mistborn stuff. It's like, that's a young relationship. That's a young man's game. And then you have this relationship in Mistborn Era 2 that is complex and deep and, and feels so real and so 
passionate and and by the end of it you're like how could these people not be together yeah and i think sort of to contrast vin and ellen again in a world that is very chaotic and stressful it's so nice that wax and steris are able to find something to anchor them and ground them and give them solace amid everything else that happens but speaking of that craziness like i also love that steris has the backup packs for oh, wax man it's my favorite aspect is she steris is literally my favorite i have talked about this before on the pod but i love steris and i love how we get to watch her be surprising through wax's eyes wax gets to be surprised by her and then through him we get to like be just constantly surprised by steris who is not who we thought she was i think that's probably the best aspect of steris's and like, Steris makes this relationship. Wax is cool. Yes. But the relationship is great because Steris, Steris is just there being quietly badass and nobody knows. And, like, it's so awesome. But Wax knows. that, And that's what it comes well, down he, to. He comes to find out. Yeah. Right? He comes to find out and is, like, so wondrously pleased by this discovery. I think that another huge aspect of the relationship is is that Steris is the type of individual who Wax is allowed or able and capable of being weak to or expressing his weakness as an individual. I think that even though Wax has this great love from his early life ripped away from him and then he finds out in very very complex form like that relationship was not what he thought it was as it was actually a his entire relationship was actually set up a little bit by harmony and planned as an aspect of harmony's greater emphasis but he thought it was this really deep and passionate relationship and he had this deep connection to lessie and then he, he has that taken away and he's like, I'll never love again type of thing. It's just like, I'm, I'm a lone warrior out here with my boy in the roughs. And then Steris comes along and she is complex and interesting. And I think that by the end, Wax is able to be a person with Steris that he never could have been with anybody else. Yeah, and I think because Steris is quite understated and she is not um like ostentatiously emotional either and she's able to just sit quietly and allow wax to have the space to feel whatever he's feeling like that's what gives him the permission to be vulnerable is that he knows he doesn't need to say anything or explain anything or even express anything that they can just sit quietly and like she'll just be there for him. That was the moment of quiet that I wanted to give everybody. <laughs> the real beauty of this relationship for me comes in those moments of weakness and then those moments of surprise that you mentioned earlier about when Wax is surprised by Asteris and Asteris just keeps surprising us over and over and over Steris again. Asteris is the real MVP. I, I mean, I said it before. I'll say it again. Like, the reason the relationship is so great is because Steris is so great. I want so much more in this world. We have one more book, right? That's coming out. Yes, relatively soon. Relatively. Cosmere Drought, relatively. folks. Cosmere Drought. We're going to get through it. We're going to survive. Like It's going to be okay. The rains will come again, and we will be bathed in the Cosmere awesomeness. But I, I want more of their relationship. I, in many ways compare it to some of the best relationship writing that I've seen in fantasy. Like a lot of people are misborn diehards uh, for the classic, the era one and are like so, so on air two. but man, wax and Steris's relationship, the relationships in general and the characters in general in era two, to me really elevate yes. the level of those stories. I think exactly like they could have been, simplistic and they're not because of the characters and i guess it depends on what you read for maybe some people are more like action or plot driven in their reading pursuits to me a story is only as good as the relationships within it so that's why i like 
those better. Well, in that case, then let's go back to the creme de la creme, the masterpiece. Our favorite, well, my favorite relationship, don't want to speak for you, Brooke, but the relationship in the Stormlight Archive between Dalinar Colin and Novani Colin. I love them. They are our heroes, our, our guide points, our North Stars. Basically, I just want to grow up and be Dalinar and the body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that their relationship, obviously, now we're at the oldest couple that we have looked at so far. The Both of these individuals have been married previously. Both of them- They have adult children. They have adult they children. They are like fully formed, very mature, sure of who they are. In many respects, Dalinar and Navani are two people who never should have been together uh, because they are related by marriage and they are, in quotes, family. But especially in their culture, uh, they are considered family. So from that respect... Well, but their relationship goes from before that. And that's what I mean. So in many respects, they never should have been together. But in many other respects, they They always always should should have have been been together. together. (laughs) That is what I love about this relationship is that in the slightly different universe of Rashar, in a slightly different trajectory, Dalinar and Navani were always together and their children uh, were their first children. Like that was their only relationship and they just loved each other from the very beginning. But then, of course, you have to wonder, you know, maybe they were supposed to get together only now that they're older like who knows if they really would have been all that compatible as younger people because they were completely different people i think especially dalinar we obviously see more of him in his younger years and oathbringer um but who knows if they really would have been compatible plus you also wouldn't have had yasna who is clearly hugely important Mm -hmm. for the like survival of roshar and i mean adolin but renarin would also not exist. Never so... forget about the Renarin folks. <laughs> okay, obviously the only way it could have played out is the way it did play out. But then but then also like how beautiful is that? Because I think we see typically in media a lot more stories about young love, right? Yes. And people feeling like you you have to find that person when you're relatively young um in order for it to be whatever good. Um and so I like that this is such a beautiful story of two people who are actually perfect together now that they're older and more mature. It makes the entire experience of the relationship so much more meaningful in some respects is that it doesn't feel uh, offhand. It doesn't feel as a just a side aspect of life like well the world's ending and you're the only other person (laughs) that i can be with because you know i'm 16 and you're 16 so like we were probably gonna end up no no like the the intentionality yes exactly it's it's their intention to be together that they both like really think about it they think about it concretely and practically and they decide you know with eyes wide open as to who each other are like there are no um there are no secrets there are no surprises so sort of opposite to wax and steris nothing is surprising about each other right they know full well exactly who this person is that they're marrying i think that that aspect of their relationship is so powerful and it it is probably best expressed in their wedding vows which (laughs) happen right at the beginning of oathbringer yeah you jump in and it's like wedding yeah and that's gosh i love the beginning of oathbringer (laughs) let's just all go back and read oathbringer again people but we have the wedding that is officiated if that's the word we want to use by the storm father himself uh, and he, we're not going to play this out, are we? Hold on. So in their wedding vows, Stormfather is present and is questioning, almost challenging, Navani. And he says, do oaths hold meaning to you? The right oaths, Navani said. And your oath to this man? I swear it to him and to you and any who care to listen. 
Dalinar Colin is mine, and I am his. You have broken oaths before. All people have, Navani said, unbowed. We're frail and foolish. This one I will not break. I vow it. And the Stormfather seems content, and Dalinar swears likewise that Navani Colin is his, and I am hers, and it is so clear. <laughs> it's so beautiful. It's, oh my god. In my opinion, the creme de la creme of this entire relationship episode that we're talking about. Like, this is the example, the high watermark of relationships in many sense because of what you mentioned earlier, the intentionality, the choice, the decision, the saying of we're frail and foolish, that we make mistakes. I vow it. I will not break it. Like, this is my decision fully. And then the most powerful Spren that we know of right now. Well, but also, like, a Spren whose purpose is to bind things together, right? The idea that the Stormfather, as one of the few three spren that we know of that can bond with bond smiths like this is hugely significant in the and the way that it's hugely significant is so cool as well like i just i love all aspects of this relationship i love that there is confusion and hesitation i love that there is steadiness and i love that navani picks up all the slack when dalinar goes Oh, dang. in the <sighs> yeah oathbringer is another just great instance where navani is the real mvp she is so badass in oathbringer and i don't think she gets enough credit i mean she gets a lot of credit i don't think anyone's like cheap well out whatever credit she gets is not enough <laughs> <laughs> lady power all the way i think that that is one of the great aspects of this relationship is that they are individuals that are equally matched in yes. so many different ways which is so difficult i think because dalinar is such a powerful man in yeah. so many different ways physically and mentally and his his moral sort of power and fortitude and then he literally becomes a magic wielder and is almost <laughs> invincible like the, it's a lot to compete with how do you make a woman yeah. equal to that man or, or just how do you make a character equal to ability that ability to partner with someone so strong yes. as that and i love that navani feels just as strong and stable and grounded and powerful as dalinar does in different ways but in her own way the fact that she is so incredibly intelligent and smart and she wields that um and her sexuality i love that an older woman is allowed to be pretty overtly um sexual and sensual in fact way more sexual or sensual than the younger characters yes which is like you know the traditional norm is like young people are sexy and right. they are the high water mark <laughs> they're, the, they're the what we hold up in society you watch right them. as like the pinnacle of yeah. attractiveness exactly and... but it's like <laughs> no i don't want no children like <laughs> give me a woman and that's what i'm looking for Who's like, like confident and yes. she knows what she wants and she has the sort of fuck it all can i say that on this podcast it's your podcast you do whatever you want <laughs> to like defy any social conventions and she's really the one who's like pushing dalinar to like let's just do it man like let's get married i don't care about society yeah dalinar's like well there's politics yeah, and like, different things i need to honor blah blah <laughs> way of kings she's and like, blah blah damn it dude <laughs> let's get in bed and they do and we assume it's great i think that <laughs> I think that there is a tremendous amount of emotion and connection between these two characters that's deep and important and significant. And just like I was saying with yeah. Shalon and Adolin, they started far apart and they're coming together again with another marriage in the middle book. I'm just so excited to see how they grow. Do you have any problems or 
hesitations about Dalinar and Navani's picture of love, how their love is portrayed, since both of them do have that previous relationship. Yes, their spouses are dead, but, you know, is there any hesitation on your part where it questions the relationship? I don't think so. I think... Because kind of like you said, they there's this aspect to their relationship where even outside of anything romantic or sexual, when none of that is happening, even when they're not sure what's going on in that respect, they are still steadfastly by each other's sides, just as people, as friends, as colleagues, as two people who have known each other for a very long time, who are supportive of each other um, in a completely platonic way, you know? And so I think that, like foundation in addition to the romantic feelings that they have and the way that their particular skill sets complement each other i think they're perfect together we really want to know what you think about these relationships that we've mentioned or any of the other relationships that are purely romantic or sexual, however you want to describe the relationship. But we want to know what you think. Reach out to us on Twitter or Facebook or Reddit. I believe that one of the best aspects of Brandon's writing and kind of one of the surprising aspects of Brandon's writing for me, because I got in it for the action. Like, that's what I wanted. I wanted some cool Mistborn stuff happening. That's what I was doing. But one of the best realizations of Brandon's writing is how powerful these characters are, how important their relationships are, and how real their relationships feel. And I'm certain that other fans feel the same way. We also know we didn't get to all the relationships. We know there's more out there. We tried to pick the ones that have the most screen time, so to speak. But there's more out there. So if you have a, a specific one that you like. Or people that you ship who haven't gotten together yet. Ooh, that's probably yeah. a big conversation. Tell us your so. ships. Oh my gosh. <laughs> or we just, I want like. Comments all day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Generating a lot of comments here. Because when you start to get into what could be, what's the possibility, you know who I ship hecka hard, even though it doesn't make any Ooh, sense tell me, tell at me. all. I want hoyd and chris to get together <laughs> so bad don't they like hate each other the one time we see them interact i yes i think that's true but like <laughs> they're the weird characters that are like in the background of things like chris is always on these planets right. and hoyd oh is gosh, like doing his funny. own thing so like in my mind i like secretly want them to have this relationship that weirdly has Just, been like, happening jumping through over time. A, yeah kind of like that <laughs> Like, it's like the best time travel love story you could imagine, whatever one that is for you. I kind of want that to be the story of, like, where, you know, Shalon and Aelin, Dalinar and Navani, they have a love story that develops over a lifetime. I want that Hoyd and Chris to be developing over many millennia. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> That's my ship for you guys. <laughs> it throw out your own. Thank you again for the episode topic recommendation. Um, I wish I had looked up who gave that to us, but thank you. If you, listener, have any topics that you would like to hear us talk about, definitely let us know. Again, next week, we're going to be talking about parental or mentor relationships, and then week after will be friendships slash rivalries. So you can also hit us up with some mentions of your favorites so that we do talk about those uh, in our next two episodes. That's all for now. Brooke, can you take us away? Until next time, life before death. Strength before weakness. Journey before destination. 